everything we do is off the theory of constraints. We say, how do we do more of what's working? And we continue to do more of what's working until something else gets in the way of us doing more of what's working. And then we ask the question, why can't we do it? And the answer to that question is typically the constraint. And then all of our resources will get deployed towards relieving that constraint. And then we go back to doing as much of that thing that made us money as possible. And if you don't know how to relieve that constraint, that's your lack of skill. And then you gain that skill. Let's say you have to gain that skill. Let's say you have to be become a promoter. How would you go about? I'll do a microcosm of this. So the ads thing I was saying earlier, I didn't know how to run national ad campaigns. Campaigns. So I knew how to run them locally, but then when we wanted to scale gym launch, I was like, I got to learn how to do this nationally. I have no idea. How do you target gym owners? And so I uh, got on the phone with um, agency owners and uh, I didn't have a ton of money at the time. And so I just said, hey, can you um, run my ads, but also show me what you're doing? And they all said no. And so finally, I was like on the sixth call, uh, the guy said no. And I was like, dude, it's America. Like, just name a price. Like, what would it take? And this is one of my favorite it's questions. Is, yeah. I was like, what, That's a good line. Yeah. What would it take? I use that line all the time. Like, what would it take to get a deal done? What would it take for us to do five YouTube videos a week that are 10 out of 10 quality? And then we can just decide the trade off if it's worth it. That particular agency owner said, I don't sell my time, but I would do it for $7.50 an hour. And I was like, okay. And so I bought eight hours from him for six grand. And I showed up to every call with like notes and recordings. And I need I needed to learn how to do this. We go document demonstrate, duplicate. So I have to figure out the checklist of all the things they do. What are the behaviors? And then uh, you do it in front of me and then I do it in front of you. And then as long as I can duplicate, then I have the skill now. I learned this from Layla was when we want to learn a new skill, we also interview people for the skill. Because usually it's a company that has a, a void. But we'll get on the phone with 10 or 20 people with the intention, obviously, of hiring, you know, somebody who's really good. But if you talk to 10 or 20 people that are all like senior director of, you know, customer success, he said, hey, walk me through some of the metrics that you track for this. And then how do you move these metrics? So what activities do you do to change them? My belief is that you can tell someone's skill by the quantity and quality of metrics they track. Easier thing is sales because most people who are listening get what that is. If I talk to a sales director and I say, first off, how do you make this company more money? Now, if they say something like, well, I'm going to increase sales. It's like, no, but you're not going to be on the phone. So how do you increase sales? And so then it's like you start to put a little bit of pressure. And then because if they can't tie the activities that they do to revenue generation on the interview, then for sure they're not going to do when they work for you. Yeah. Um, and some guys are like, oh, you know, I'm just going to I'm going to roll up the team and I'm going to you know get them excited. We're going to do some training. That's not going to be a good sales manager. Right. If someone says, well, I'm going to look at, you know, the offer percentage that we have, I'm going to look at our scheduling rates, I'm going to look at our show rates. If show rates are low, I'm going to do this. If offer rates are low, we're going to look at marketing, make sure the messaging's right. If we're struggling with whatever, a specific obstacle, then what I'm going to do is I'm just going to isolate that obstacle and then we're going to drill it. I'm going to look at that particular rep's closing percentage and make sure that it gets up to KP. If he starts breaking down all of these pieces, then I'm like, okay, not only is he tracking the metrics, but he knows how to affect them. And so then also when I talk to four other guys, and I get onto the fourth call, that first guy might've said something that I didn't know about. But when I go on the fourth call, I'm like, so what do you think about this? Yeah. And then how they respond to it. Right. I get better and better at it. And so then I start to know what to look for. And then if I still have no idea, then that's when I'll pay somebody. I mean, I, I'm still the biggest fan of one-on-one tutoring. It's like out of vogue now, but I'll pay anybody to learn something. I offered someone $350,000 for dinner. He said, no, I offered 250 and then we offered 350. He's like, fine. He didn't even take the money. He's like, I'll just meet you for dinner because yeah. <laughs> you're so desperate. But I wanted to understand branding. Because it was, it was this thing that I, I realized that I didn't understand. So in Gym Launch, it was very much an arbitrage business, like a media arbitrage business. And so everything was quant based. And that was kind of like how it was all, all I cared about was just like, what are CTRs? What are CPMs? What's our cost per lead? You know, what, what schedule, what show, what's close rate? And that's all I cared about was just blowing as much money through that, that, that funnel as possible. The moment that changed my life around this, and this is ultimately the, the beginning of my path down to building a personal brand was, this is going to sound embarrassing. It's very embarrassing. I saw Kylie Jenner on the cover of Forbes. And I think she was 19 or 20. And I think I was 27 at the time. And I thought I was hot shit because I was like, I'm taking on a million and a half a month, like personally. Yeah. And it said she was a billionaire. And I was like, she's a girl. She's seven years younger than me. And Because at the time I was still young. Now I'm just yeah. a white dude. But like before this, I was at least a young white dude. Yeah. <laughs> and so when I saw that, I have this fundamental belief that if someone makes more money than you, then they know something about business that you don't know. And then they're better than you in some way. And so you have to figure out how, what it is. And so I looked at everything. I was like, I got to figure out this brand stuff. Like it's it's the brand. I don't have a brand. And so then I went through this long, I was like, do I want to be known publicly? Fame has pros and cons. And at this point in my life, it has more pros than cons. Thing is, is that the pros of fame, there were some pros that I didn't expect. The biggest one 
is recruiting. Our ability to attract talent now is unparalleled. And that has probably driven more alpha from the investment than anything. The companies we started investing in, there is no way that some of the top talent that we put in those companies would have even taken a call with those companies. But we recruit from Holdco. They see a private equity firm slash family office. They can look at a whole bunch of our content, be like, these people seem okay. They don't want to work at a $10 million revenue business, but if it's part of a family office where you could grow and grow your skill set, that's- Yeah. And if you prove yourself, we can move you over. And if you want to be in a different industry, we've got different industries. And if you crush it, then you can come up to hold co and then basically act as an advisor for all of those roles across the portfolio. And so like our director of CS directs all the directors of CS in all the portfolio companies. Our director of sales directs and recruits the sales directors for all the portfolio companies. Now, what what this does is it gives us a huge amount of leverage and kind of like inside man for all the companies. And so because we recruit some of the leaders, they have a good relationship with us. So we're not like this the board, you know what I mean? Yeah. They're like, oh no, it's Alex and Layla. And they're the, they're the ones who brought me in. My first three interviews were with acquisition.com. And then they put me into this business as my last two interviews. And so that's more or less the process that that we run in order to place talent. So that's been a huge, that's been the, probably the biggest unforeseen benefit from fame has been our ability to recruit talent. Um, obviously the deal flow stuff is, I mean, that's the, the obvious benefit. Those are probably the two biggest ones. Access to people. To be candid with you, I don't reach out to many people. Why? Take this the way I mean it to everyone who's listening. I'm pretty sure I know what I need to do. What activities I need to do in order to hit the goals that we have in the next 12 to 24 months. It is straightforward. And so the only thing that separates me from that is doing it. And so I basically try to eliminate all meetings. There's a concept of efficiency versus effectiveness. Yeah. And you're clearly very efficient. How do you know that you're effective? How, how do you have such certainty around that? The outcomes that we've generated so far, you know, in December of 2016, I had a thousand bucks and we have a lot more than a thousand bucks now. How much of your success is based on thousands of hours of hard work versus high IQ? You deconstruct everything on a skill set basis, but isn't there a minimum IQ that you need to be successful in business? I think it depends on the business and it depends on the timeline. I've seen all manners of business owners walk through our doors here at acquisition.com. I've seen some guys with janitorial businesses doing 40, $50 million a year. And I wouldn't say that they were super high IQ. They just stuck with it for 20 years. I think the, the narrower the field of focus, the lower the IQ requirement. Because fundamentally, if you have a sound original model and you continue to try on a long enough time horizon, eventually you try something and it does work. And then that gives you the next, you know, peg, you know, up on the, on the ladder. And you just keep doing that. I think where a lot of entrepreneurs get in trouble is that they try too many things. So you just don't get enough failures in a narrow enough scope so that you can move forward. I've been really thinking about this paradigm of transactional versus relational businesses. I'm very much a straight shooter. And sometimes people are put off by that, by the transactional nature, but it's meant to be an honest trade. And sometimes historically, I would feel bad about that. And then I noticed an interesting thing that anytime that somebody pushes back on that and says, I'm like, I'm not transactional, yeah. they have never executed.